Amen. It's good to be in church Amen. on this Sunday morning. Give honor to my pastor, my dad. Amen. He's getting some rest. Let's remember him in prayer that he would receive vision and strength for us when he returns. Thank him for the opportunity to speak today. We're going to be just in one verse of scripture to start. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In verse number 13, if you would like to turn there, 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. It says this in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you or allow for you, to be tempted above that you are able, yes. but will with the temptation yes. also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. With the help of the Lord, I want to preach to us today on another door. Another Amen. door. Would you put your Bibles down? Could we just pray one more time? Would you pray for me that the Lord would use me to speak a word? This day, Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to love you, God. I pray for a spirit of liberty to continue in this room, Lord, and that someone would be healed, that someone would be touched by the Holy Ghost, Lord. We thank you and we give you all glory and praise, God, for your love and mercy, for your kindness toward us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated this morning. It was in the fall of 2014, and I found myself to be behind enemy lines. I was in West Lafayette, Indiana. Now, even if you're not a basketball fan today, if you're from Indiana, you probably know that West Lafayette is home to Purdue University, or more specifically, to Purdue University's men's basketball team, arch rivals to our Indiana University Hoosiers, thus me saying I was behind enemy lines in West Lafayette. I was there for two reasons. First of all, I was there to hear my dad preach. He was preaching for a friend of his up there on that Sunday night. And secondly, I was there to see my friend. Josh, who happened to go to the church that my dad had been invited to speak at. After service, a group of us, we went out to eat at this 24-hour diner called Triple X. Now, I'm glad to report to you today that the name of this diner is quite misleading, <laughs> as it is your classic kid-friendly diner. It's one of those diners that's characterized by spinning bar stools and old bun coffee machines, that signature fluorescent lighting that buzzes and hums, and a waitress that firmly yet affectionately calls you hunt. It was one of those <laughs> diners, but I digress. Despite the comforting atmosphere that a middle American diner affords, my friend and I, we decided that we wanted to leave early to go and explore the nearby campus. As we perused around the various buildings, we happened on a desolate Mackey Arena, otherwise known as Katy Court, home court to produce men's and women's basketball teams. Now, I'm not sure if it was because it had just started to rain and we were desperate for refuge from the rain or if it had to do with the rush that you get when you suddenly have a rebellious idea. But whichever the case, Josh and I, we got inspired. We got inspired to find our way inside of that building. And so we tried the doors to the main entrance first. And unsurprisingly, they were locked. And then we walked around to the opposite side of the building and we tried the doors to the other main entrance and they too were locked. Only a few minutes had gone by at this point and our inspiration was already all but extinguished from the rain. Yielding 
to the discomfort of wet church clothes on a cold autumn night, we started back for the car, and it was at this point, when coming around the corner of the building, that I noticed a dimly lit side entrance with a maintenance van parked next to a door that read, authorized personnel only. And so Josh and I kind of look at each other, and then we look around, and then we tiptoe towards this door with the expectation of it being locked. I mean, after all, it was for authorized use only. But this time, and to our surprise, the door had swung wide open. This was a moment of decision for us. And to be quite honest, I don't think we were quite ready for it. I don't think we thought that we would actually be able to get in to this building. And so would we go in? Would we go in knowing that we would possibly be caught, at best, kicked out, at worst? I don't know. I hadn't trespassed before, but do we get arrested? I... Or do we chicken out, proving that we never had the guts to go in to begin with in order to spare you from unnecessary suspense and to avoid belaboring the story? We went in. We went in. I remember walking around the main hallway that circles the bowl where the court is and the lights, they were motion censored. And so we're walking and dish, 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 lights are coming on. It's like a spotlight is being put on us. But somehow, I don't know how, we weren't caught. And we wound up, Jacob, standing at center court in Mackey Arena in our muddy shoes, looking out at thousands of empty seats that we could barely see because it was so dark in there. I have a picture. I don't know if it's very legible, but there, there it is. Now, I would be lying to you today as a Hoosier fan if I told you that I didn't feel a little bit of satisfaction in leaving a trail of mud on our rival's home floor. <laughs> but I know, I know that that's not Christian. That somebody who may care less about basketball had to clean up that mud. And so, in Jesus' name, Lord, forgive me if you guys needed to hear me say that. But what I want to point out, it's not the fact that we got in, which I think is pretty cool, but it is the way we got in, how we got in. That is through a side door, through a door unaccounted for, a door unexpected, a door apparently for authorized personnel only. It serves as a simple analogy for how the enemy of our souls will use unsuspecting means to get into the places where he's not welcome, wow. where he's not authorized being. Came a time in my fight, talking about me, came a time in my fight with a particular sin where because of the growth that I have experienced, Satan no longer could use the obvious entry points through which he once had been granted routine access. After years of success and failure, of falling and getting back up again, and a lot of grace in between, I learned, I am learning, that the entrances to my heart, they need to be secured in such a way and to such an extent that it would be difficult for even me to unlock them. Although this sermon is somewhat about the stratagem of evil, or of the devil, or whatever you want to call it, I should pause here to say that much of the time, if not most of the time, I am the assailant yeah. against my own soul. Not the devil. I give him way too much credit. Right. Not anybody else, not the world or any spiritual force, but me, that I need to be saved from me. Paul, he writes to us in Romans 7. Really, he relates with us in Romans 7, in verse 18, and he says, for I know that in me. Somebody say, in me. me. That is, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. To want to be, do the good thing, it is present with me. But how to perform that good thing, I find not. I don't know. For the good that I would do, the good that I want to do, I don't do. But the evil which I would not, the thing that I don't want to do, that's the thing I do. 
Now if I do that, I would not. If I do the thing I don't want to do, it's no more I that does it, but sin that dwelleth in me. It's this fallen nature in me. He says, I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, he says. I really do have good intentions, but I see another law in my members or in this fallen body warring against the law of my mind, warring against the law of my good intentions, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And then in verse 24, it's as if he's talked himself into this point of frenzy and frustration. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? You ever been there? Just get sick of yourself a little bit? A wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And then he provides the answer to the question that he asks. He says, thanks be to God. Through Jesus Christ. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. And so if we could just strip that down into its most basic parts, Paul recognized that he could not save himself, but that he needed the experience and the empowerment of the Holy Ghost in order to pursue biblical obedience and faithfulness. But it all began with him saying, for I recognize that there is no good thing in me that is in my flesh, that I need to be saved from myself. The added measures of security that I had installed over the course of time ensured that when the enemy came knocking, which he would, or when I felt weak in my flesh, which I would, I wouldn't think of opening that door as being a legitimate option anymore, because now I wanted to please Jesus, because I had grown in him. Now I was pursuing obedience by and through the power of the Holy Ghost and not myself. The trouble with Satan, though, is that he has a knack for locating the hidden entrances to our souls. This is why Peter tells us to be sober-minded, to be vigilant, to be aware, because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking. He walks about seeking those that he may devour. That if he's no longer welcome through the front door, through the way he used to get in, through the way he's used to getting in. No bother, he'll seek out another way. He'll seek out a way that I'm not aware of or have turned myself off to, perhaps because of the pain in my past that it triggers. He seeks the side door, tempting me in ways that I didn't even know were possible. He roams about as a roaring lion, seeking a side door, a dimly lit side entrance. I was reminded in writing this of David, of King David, specifically two of his psalms, which are respective in and of themselves, but they're also kind of related. The first one is Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, David, he writes this prayer of confession and contrition, repentance for sin that he had committed with Bathsheba, adultery that he had committed with this woman, And then he essentially commits murder and sending her husband Uriah, who ironically was one of his mighty men, one of his great warriors, to the front lines of a battle to ensure his death, to try and cover up his sin with Bathsheba. And after nine months, at least, of being unrepentant, he finally comes to this point of recognition of his sin, and he writes this in Psalm 51, Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, I love that he owns it. He says, mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. He says, behold, in verse 6, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part of my heart, Lord, you shall make me to know wisdom. Wash me thoroughly. And then in Psalm 139, which is this psalm about God's omniscience, his all-knowingness, his thoughts toward us, and his presence around us, David says this, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. Know my heart and know my thoughts and see if there be any, any wickedness in me so that I might be led in the way everlasting. Here's what I see 
And these two verses, if I could just kind of time together. Wash me thoroughly and see me thoroughly. Wash me thoroughly. See me thoroughly. In other words, King David didn't want for there to remain in him a door unaccounted for. Yeah. A space wherein yeah. self or Satan could sneak in and snatch his joy from him. His worship. And that's why he went on and prayed in Psalm 51. Restore unto me the joy of salvation that I might teach transgressors your ways. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel like something the Lord is dealing with me about lately is that more than him wanting my honesty, he wants my transparency. And I recently heard a helpful definition that distinguishes the two. Honesty is where if you ask me a question, Reese, I respond to you honestly. Mm -hmm. I respond to you truthfully or in a satisfactory way. That honesty is a response to a prompting. But transparency is where I would bring that truth to bear before you on my own of my own will and on my own accord. That honesty is a response. Transparency, it's proactive. It's preemptive. King David, he didn't want for there to remain in him a door unaccounted for. That's why he prayed, search me. Oh God, know my heart. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me, a way that I'm suppressing and that I need to bring out and into the light before you, or a way that I don't know about, that I need to know about so that I can repent of it, Lord. Wash me and see me. Shore me up, Lord. Close those doors. Whether it's through the front door, through the obvious ways, or through a side door, through an obscure way. The shame that we can feel as a result of sin slipping through is familiar to us. In other words, while the sin may vary in kind over the course of time, the consequence that is shame, it stays the same. Shame pretty much just feels the same. And the enemy, please someone hear this today, the enemy uses the familiarity of shame as a weapon of discouragement against the believer in order to convince her that nothing has really changed, that she's not really changed, thus denying her the recognition of growth that has actually occurred in her. Can I say that one more time? Can I read it again? The enemy uses the familiarity of shame, that familiar feeling of shame, as a weapon of discouragement against the believer in order to convince him that nothing has really changed, that he's not really changed, thus denying him the recognition of growth that has actually occurred in him. And so suppose you slipped up for the first time in a long time this week. You've been doing good by all standards, right? You've grown in your faith. You're pursuing obedience in Christ by and through his spirit, through faith. But you messed up. You sinned. And you feel ashamed. The enemy, he takes that shame and he puts it in your face and he says, see, you haven't changed. You're the same person as you were 20 years ago. You think you've taken 20 steps forward? You've taken two inches forward. Satan's desire is for us to believe that we are still under bondage because he understands that our behavior will follow after what we believe. And so he uses sin and shame to form like this circular, cyclical relationship. And here's what happens. We sin. We miss the mark. We miss the target. And we feel ashamed. Right? Right. Can I get a witness today? Right. 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 We feel ashamed for the sin that we've committed against the Lord, against somebody else, Mm -hmm. against our own bodies. And because we feel ashamed... We feel unlovable or unworthy of love. And if we're convinced that we're unworthy of love, instead of taking that shame and sin back to where it belongs, the cross and the blood of Jesus, where do we take it? We go back to sin. Because sin can alleviate it, the pain and the discomfort of shame, for a moment. But that's the problem. It's just a moment. And then what? We're sitting in our shame again. And then we're left with a decision. Am I going to believe shame? Or am I going to go to the cross with my shame? And this 
circle starts happening, and it results in slavery. And that's where the enemy wants to have us today, is as slaves. He wants to keep us as slaves, but we're not slaves today. And this is good news. Can I tell you why it's good news? Because it's exactly why Jesus Christ came to this earth, to set free those who are bound in their shame and in their sin, that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He came for this purpose. Jesus said when he started his ministry in Luke chapter 4 and verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me or empowered me or ordained me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight, to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, them that are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Amen. He came to save the ashamed. He came to save me Amen. and you. And there are days when I wake up to outdated shame. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Shame from my past that has to do with sins that I have repented of, right. sins that are forgiven. But I wake up to memories, nonetheless, that taunt me and try to convince me that I haven't changed, that I haven't grown in the Lord. And it is on those days that I tell myself, and I've had to do it this week, it's on those days that I tell myself where my flesh condemns me, the Spirit of the Lord affirms me, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, to those who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Amen. It's on those days when my heart condemns me that I quote Scripture and I say, if my heart condemns me, God is greater than my heart, that though my heart and my flesh may fail me, God is the strength of my heart, yeah. and He is my portion forever. Yes. Come on, the Spirit of the Lord can give you strength to overcome your shame today. You don't have to live under that bondage. You don't have to live under that fear. He set you free. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> to be sure, the devil does not care what it is that makes you feel misery. He just cares that you are miserable. He is indifferent. He is the opposite of love. He doesn't care what it is that makes you feel misery. He just cares that you are miserable. While he is subtle, cunning, and strategic, at the end of the day, it's unimportant to him how the damage is done as long as it is done. Jesus said about Satan in John chapter 8 that he was a murderer from the beginning, that we shouldn't expect anything else from him, that he has only come but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. He roams about as a lion, seeking those that he may devour. He's an accuser of the brethren, Scripture says. But against the persistence of Satan, and against the persistence of myself, to which we all can attest, there is a response today. There is a promise in Scripture. And so we circle back to 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. It says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. We could just stand on that for a minute. Yeah. Jesus is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted. He won't allow for you to be tempted above what you are able. He won't let the enemy get above your able. He won't let the enemy get above your ability and capacity to resist temptation and to pursue him, but he will with the temptation. <laughs> Also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And so here's sort of the sticky statement for today. For every door unaccounted for where sin can get in, the grace of God provides another door where I can get out. That the Lord will not allow for us to be tempted beyond the means that He has already provided for our deliverance right now. Our pastor preaches it to us routinely, that He has given us His name today. He has given us His Spirit today. He has given us His Word today. 
And because of Brother Luke's message on Wednesday night, I added this fourth one. He has given us his body. That's right. He has given us his church that we can confide in and confess to and find refuge in. There's no temptation that hath taken you. That's right. But such as is common to man. He's going to make a way of escape. I love the way the Amplified Bible says the second part of this verse. If you could throw that up there, Brother Tabor. It says, But God is faithful to His Word and to His compassionate nature, and He can be trusted not to let you be tempted and tried and assayed beyond your ability and strength of resistance and power to endure. But with the temptation, He will always also provide the way out, the means of escape to a landing place that you may be capable and strong and powerful to bear up under it patiently, that he will always also, I love that, every time, provide the way out, that God is faithful, that God is our refuge and strength, the psalmist, a very present help, (laughs) not just a present help, he's a very present help. That he's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. That he draws near to the brokenhearted, to such who are of a contrite spirit. He draws near to those who draw near to him. He's always going to be there. Making a way of escape. That we might be able to bear it. That we might be able to live for him and succeed in righteousness. Not perfection, but in righteousness by our faith in him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul, he reflects on this thorn in the flesh. And I think that this personal account that he gives, it's a convenient connection to 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Makes me wonder if he thought about it. You know, when he shared this personal testimony, if you could say it like that about where he had received visions in the Lord, revelations in the Lord. And he said, whether I was in the body or out of the body, I don't know. Only the Lord knows. And he said that there was this messenger of Satan sent to me to buffet me, to keep me from becoming spiritually arrogant or conceited. Brother Esau preached a really good message a few weeks ago called Abounding Consolations. It's on our podcast. You guys should listen to it. But um, if you haven't heard it, or you should listen to it again. It was that good. But this messenger of Satan is sent to buffet him, to keep him from becoming conceited, and he gives him this thorn in the flesh, right? We don't know what the thorn is, which allows for us to fit ourselves into it, our situation into it, and he brings this thorn in his flesh to the Lord and asks him to relieve him of it, to take it from him, and his appeal is denied, but the Lord does answer him. And he says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. For my strength is made perfect in your weakness. My strength finds opportunity and occasion in your weakness. Most gladly, therefore, therefore, Paul says, excuse me, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon my shoulders. Because of Paul's experience today, we can know, and we're no different than Paul. The Lord didn't love Paul any more than he loves us. But because of Paul's experience, we can know that Jesus will not allow for us to be given a thorn for which there is not also an accompanying special grace that covers it. That he will provide the grace that you need, sufficient grace, to succeed in the struggle. That he won't put more on you than you can bear. That there hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful. Yes. who will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape. You might be able to bear it. Let's go ahead and stand. Amen. Amen. In Jesus' name. You, you just lift a hand in faith and thank the Lord for His grace and mercy, His empowering grace, the grace wherein we stand and find strength that there is a promise today for every door unaccounted for where sin can get in, the Lord provides another door where I can get out. And it's His grace. It's His mercy. It's His kindness. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lord. So the question today is not, what is the way of escape? The question, the right question, is who is the way of escape? Thank you, Jesus. Just being super simple with it. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is the way of escape. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yes. Jesus is the door. It is so. Yes, yes, yes. He said, I am the door. Glory. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and he will go in and out. Glory. And find pasture. He'll be at liberty to come and go as he pleases. So ironically, kind of the twist, the turn today, is that the way out of our trouble, the way out of our trial, the way out of our temptation, the way out is in. It's in Jesus. Yes. Proverbs says that the name of the Lord is a strong, is a strong tower. Yeah. The righteous run into it. Run. My God. And they are saved. Yeah. The way out is in. You can't go wrong running to Jesus. I want to go back to that verse in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. I want to end here. The Lord says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, he says, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. May rest. Um, I remember Brother Cooper told me not too long ago that there's a key to every sermon. And I've thought about that. And like it's amazing. I can spend hours here at the church trying real hard to figure out <laughs> what the key is, you know? Clenching my fists, gritting my teeth. And I don't figure it out until I go home and take a nap. Lay down to take a nap. And I don't know how it is for you, but that's usually when the Lord just kind of puts his hand on my chest, nudges me. And that happened on Thursday. And I felt like I needed to look this verse up in the Greek. Now, I try to stay away from using biblical languages in preaching because I don't feel adequate to handle that, quite honestly. But I felt like I needed to do this. And so I went to this little feature on biblehub.com called Interlinear Bible, and it breaks down word for word the Greek. And I came to those two words, may rest, may rest. And they come from one Greek word pronounced episkinosi. And I wrote out the phonics for that just to help me out. Episkinosi. But episkinosi, or may rest in our language, it means to raise a tent over, to dwell, yeah. to spread a tabernacle. And so if we take the Greek translation and kind of meld it on to our translation, we could literally read it this way. And he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ would spread a tabernacle over me. I don't know what you've been dealing with. I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you messed up today. Maybe you're in a season of sin and struggle. Maybe it's not sin. Maybe you identify with this in a different way, but I want you to know that you can run into the name of the Lord and you can find refuge in his presence, protection, and power in his tabernacle, that he will raise a tabernacle over you. Can we lift our hands this morning and can we just call on the name of the Lord? The only name under heaven by which we are saved the only name under heaven by which we are safe, that you are safe in the Father's arms today, that you don't have reason to fear the enemy. He's got nothing on you. God is faithful. He will not suffer you to be tempted above what you are able, but he will with the temptation make a way of escape that you might be able to bear it. And the way out 
The way out is in. The way out is by running to the name of Jesus. The righteous run to him. I want to be righteous. I want to run to the name of the Lord in my time of trouble because he's never going to refuse me. He's never going to fail me. He's never going to let me down. He's never going to send me back. He's going to receive me with open arms, with an open heart because he's my loving father. He's my heavenly father. I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. I bless you, Lord. Can we just glorify the name of the Lord right now and lift up a praise for who he is, for what he's done, for what he's going to do in your life. I believe it in Jesus' name that you can leave here encouraged today.